All right, we're live again. Huh? Let's see once people get on. It should, it'll, it'll should pop up like, um, cause it's her phone. It'll say Nicole's live on Friday night study. It'll give them an alert. We got one on. Okay, now we'll wait another minute. Pra praise the Lord. So many technical difficulties. <laughs> Tina, what's up? Christina says hi to Christina. <laughs> Hey, Tina, we're going to get started here. Okay, sounds better. All right, I'm going to give it a minute because some people are going to need to get back on right now. Hopefully, the Lord provokes their hearts to get back on. What time is it? We're going to wait till 43. <laughs> All right, better. Much better. All right, we're going to get started here. As soon as it hits 43, we're going to have two worship songs, I think. Or a couple worship songs, and then we'll get into the study. So, but we had some technical difficulties, but praise the Lord, my tech team is awesome. Top of the line, top of the line, anointed of the Lord. <laughs> All right, yeah, they said it's much better. So, hopefully, my dad can hear. All right, hopefully he gets back on anyways. Yeah, pretty soon he'll be here, so he won't have no excuse that he can't hear. Because he'll probably be sitting like right here. I can point at him. Ah, it's for you. <laughs> All right. 43. Okay, so love you guys, whoever's online. Tina, Donnie, and uh, somebody else right now in the numbers going up I can't see the name all the names but love you guys we're gonna get started we're gonna have a few worship songs and then we'll get into the study but before that let's pray let's bow our heads father we just come before you tonight with great anticipation as to what you're gonna do tonight and before we get into your word Lord we want to worship you so we lift up our praise we lift our voices and our hands to you now father because you are worthy we pray that this would be acceptable to you and that it would bless you father so may these songs that we sing to you now may it rise as a sweet smelling aroma to you we love you and we praise you in jesus name amen
praise the Lord. All right, that was good stuff. I hope you guys could hear it online. That was awesome worship. Let's pray. Father, you are greater than anything. You are higher above anything, Lord. And tonight as we come to sit at your feet and to get into your word, Lord, we pray that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon this place, that you would bless this time that you would bring glory to yourself through it, Father. Help us as we do. Help us to understand your word tonight. Give us ears to hear, Lord, because the world outside and all around us is screaming at us in every which direction. Father, help us tonight to hear your voice. So we pray that you would speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. Love you guys online. If you're sitting next to anybody at all at home turn and say god bless you shake their hand <laughs> here we can say hi <laughs> praise the lord praise the lord oh yeah i agree donnie fabulous voice online says awesome <laughs> worship all right it was good stuff maybe next week we do three songs <laughs> it was good it was good I always love worship it gets us in into the right frame of mind as we get into the word we, we come into the throne room of grace into his presence what an awesome thing it is to worship our Lord okay so like I always do I always say this really quickly I'll say it again if you are on I encourage you share the page just because it's important that we share this page is just one way you can share the gospel you can share God's word with others. This is just one way. And if the Lord puts it on your heart, I would encourage you to share the page. Joe, Jose, what's up, my brother? Go ahead and share. Like I said, we always have to share the gospel. We have the one message at our fingertips that sets people free. So I always encourage you to share. Not only on the page when you're out, when you're at work, when you're with your family. Share about Jesus Christ. Share what God has done. Another thing, if you guys need the word of God... And you don't have one, but you'd like to have one, I will send you one for free. You just got to shoot the info to me. I have some Bibles here, English Standard Version. I have some here. If you need it, just shoot me all your info, and I will send it out free of charge. Um, let me know. I think the most important thing to have in your hand is the Word of God. So if you need one, let me know. Also, YouTube channel, if you guys want to check it out, it's for those who don't like social media or don't have it. They can always check out the studies online. So you could share that Friday nights in the Bible. Anything else? If you're in the area, stop by. Come on down. We'd love to have you Friday nights. We have a ripping, roaring, rocking, and rolling kids ministry. <laughs> You'll hear it from time to time. It's so crazy. It's Pentecostal up there. So if you have kids, don't feel like you can't come. Bring them. We'd love to have them. We'd love to have you. So if you're in the area, stop on by. Anything else? Sunday morning, if you don't have a home fellowship, I know of one. A really good one. I'll let you know. Just shoot me all the, uh, all the well, just let me know. <laughs> I got tongue-tied. Just let me know, and I'll shoot you the info on a good Sunday morning service. Um, anything else? No? Without further ado, let's get into the word tonight okay so you can open your Bible to Luke chapter 9 we're gonna be picking up in verse 28 and we're gonna read through verse 36 we're gonna be looking tonight at the transfiguration something that's pretty cool I mean if I was there it would have been an awesome thing to see <laughs> but we're gonna read let's just read it all because it's not very long 28 through 36 and we'll start to get into the study Okay, picking up in verse 28 of chapter 9, Dr. Luke writes, Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, 
as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. <laughs> and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. All right. So that's an interesting <laughs> few verses there. It's a, if you start to picture it in your mind, and we're going to try to do that tonight so we have uh, an idea of what we're looking at here tonight. But let's go back a little bit and go over what we went through a little bit last week. I'm just going to touch on a few key points. So that way we're familiar with what's going on. And then as we jump into 28, I always like to say we can hit the ground running. Okay, verse 18. Remember last week that we seen the question. The question. And it is the most important question that you will ever give an answer to. But in 18, Jesus, he asked them, who do the people or who do the crowds? Who's everyone saying that I am? What's everyone saying about me? That leads into the next question. And I just referenced it, the most important question. And last week, we talked about this at great length. And we could go again, and I could go again, but I'm not going to. Who do you say that I am? As for yourself. Who do you say that I am? Very important question. Very. It is the most important question you will ever answer. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Who is he to you? And then we've seen Peter open his mouth and he speaks in verse 20, which is always a fun thing. When, <laughs> when Peter starts to talk, it's always very interesting. But Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And if you flip over to Matthew in chapter 16, that's where you'll get, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds by saying, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who's in heaven. Here in Luke, he records, you're the Christ of God. Is that what we're saying? And most of us, if we're believers, will say, yeah, amen, hallelujah. That's what I say. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's good. But what does your life say? Because your life speaks loud, volumes, oftentimes louder than anything you could ever say. And if your lips and your life don't match up, we have a problem. No ifs, ands, buts about it. Like I said, the most important question. And remember, as he's asking this question, and I'm going to touch it briefly because it was so cool to me as we went through it last week. I want to touch it again briefly. Remember the backdrop to where all this is being said. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. Um, remember the backdrop that Jesus is using as he says this. Oh, oh. The Holy Spirit's moving kind of early tonight. I can hear it. The backdrop. Jesus is contrasting it against a backdrop where the Jordan is the headwaters there that flows in to Jerusalem right there. And any water that flows in Judaism is called living water. So we have Jesus Christ standing here. Now, through digs and different things, we found 14 different temples at this site, also where Jesus is speaking, where you had shrines built for different pagan gods. We talked about it, Panias, the Greek god, not Peter Pan. <laughs> we talked about, you know, Baal, 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 however you want to say it. They had altars there for, for Baal worship. And Jesus is coming and asking this question. 
as a contrast to all the different things that have gone on there, contrasting all the pagan religion, all the worship of all the false idols and gods. And he's standing there asking, who do you say that I am? And then Peter's response, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Praise the Lord. And so I found that very interesting. And then as we moved along, we seen <laughs> then after the disciples, he's telling them that he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's going to rise. And we found that in verse 22. So he tells them all this, and that was the first instance we have of him actually telling them, I must suffer, I must die, I must rise again. And he jumps into discipleship. We have all of this, and he says, okay, good job, Peter. You said the right thing. This is what you got to do now. You want to follow me. You got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross daily. You got to follow me. You got to get rid of the old. You got to deny yourself. You take up your cross, then you follow him. And we talked about it. I don't want to get into it too much. But it's a daily thing, dying to yourself. You take up your cross daily. You deny yourself. And then you follow him. You can't live a new life and still live in the graveyard. And we talked about that last week. And the questions, some of the questions we left with, are we disciples? When we look at these things, does that describe me? And more importantly, what does my life say? Because oftentimes, and you've heard the quote, out of a hundred, one will read the Bible, the other 99 will read you. They're going to look at your life. They're going to look at your life. It's so very important, especially in the days and the times we are living in now, how important it is to live for Christ, to be completely sold out. Not one foot in, one foot out. Not coming Sunday morning, singing hallelujah, raising my hands, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then going home to the bar and getting wasted. Or going home and slapping my wife. Like I said, your lips and your life need to match up. You can't do those things. Sorry, I hate to burst the bubble of some of you. But your life speaks volumes louder than you could ever say and then as we jumped into verse 27 but he said but I tell you truly there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God and this was leading directly into what we're gonna get into now here in verse 28 the transfiguration and I usually don't do this but I'm gonna do it again the title is hear him I usually don't do that so the title of the message is Hear Him. So in verse 28 now, it says, it, it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, eight days after what we just went over really quickly, that he took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. All oh, right. This is really cool. <laughs> now this... And you guys know I make a lot of references to movies. I'm just going to say, this sounds like a really cool movie if you were to make it. <laughs> you, oh man, this could be some awesome like CGI and all kinds of different things going on. Pan the camera in and out and woo, all this. Sh yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff here. But anyways, eight days. And I'm just going to touch this part briefly. Matt and Mark say six days here we have eight days and you're gonna have people that come up oh the bible's full of contradictions right and i just want to touch this briefly because sometimes i have these conversations with people so and i want to give you guys just a little bit here because here it says eight matthew and mark it says six so just really quickly i could probably spend a whole time on this i'm not going to it but i just wanted to give you something really brief luke luke's eight days is based on a Greek way of speaking, which means about a week later. He's kind of rounding it. So that's a, an easy way to explain it. Like I said, I could go really deep into this. He could be bookending it with two different things. 
um, what we just saw, and then this, which makes it eight days. I could go into a long list. I'm not going to. But his, his usage here of the Greek, it's a way of speaking, which is a roundabout way of saying about a week. So, then it says he took Peter, James, and John. Now, I'm not really sure why these three. Um, it could be that these three are the knuckleheads of the group. <laughs> and if you have children, you usually have a couple that you got to be like, no, 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 you got to stay right here with me. Yeah, you can't go over. Your brother can go, but you can't go. Oh, why? Because you know why. You know exactly why you can't go. You have to stay with me. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. Could it be? Some people have speculated that Peter is one of them because he would be a dynamic leader. Some people have said that. He needed to be there. James, if you remember, he would have been the first one martyred. And then John, he was the last living apostle. He was the last one. He was given the martyrdom of a long life. So that's just what some people have said. I'm sure there is a particular reason for these three, but I can't specifically tell you what it is but I'm sure there is a really good reason why it's these three dudes but they went up on the mountain to pray notice it says they went up on the mountain to pray and it says as he prayed in verse 29 the appearance of his face was altered so notice it says to pray and we touch this a lot I think seven times Luke mentions Jesus praying and here we have it again. Last week, I think we had the fourth time. This would be the fifth time. And I always say this, and I'm going to say it again, because I'm always convicted when I see this. If Jesus prayed, what does that say about all of us? That we should be praying. And if we're being honest with ourselves, it's probably a whole lot more than we do now. And that's, please don't take this as condemnation, because when I say that, I'm looking right in the mirror right back at myself. I lack in so many areas. And this is one of them. And when you read it, you're like, oh, it's like a knife to the heart. Like, oh, you got me, God. I get on my knees and you start praying, just crying out to God, having communion, having fellowship with God, speaking to God. We talk about it all the time. Communication is so big in every single relationship. How much more important and how much bigger is it in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Prayer is so important. It's a lifeline. It's vital to your walk. It's vital to your spirit. We need to pray, and we need to, like Paul said, do it without ceasing. Okay, so, and it says the mountain. This is not Mount Baldy for those of you who live in California. This is what most scholars think is Mount Hermon. Some say Mount Tabor, but most say Mount Hermon. Mount Tabor, if you look at the map, and I looked it up because I was curious, because I have not been to Israel, you have Tabor way down here, you have the Sea of Galilee, so you guys can see online what I'm doing with my hands. And then up here you have Mount Hermon. Mount Tabor is way off here, so most scholars say it's Mount Hermon up here. It's located by Caesarea Philippi where those sayings were said, where this is taking place. And, and Caesarea Philippi is on the slopes of Mount Hermon. So you can Google it. It's pretty cool to look at things like that. I mean, at least for me anyways. If you're curious, you can look it up and you can see pictures and different things and pull it up on a map and then you can scale the map and, and kind of look at it. And it says, as he prayed. So now we have an idea where he's at. And it says, as he prayed, the appearance. His appearance of his face altered. So appearance is the Greek word idas. It's the shape or form. Altered, I'm going to give you guys some Greek words, so let's put on our thinking caps for a second and, and get ready. <laughs> the word for altered is heteros, which means another of a different kind. So the idea is that the very appearance of his face 
what we knew of him, what we know of him became different. Ooh. See, that's why I say this would be a good movie. <laughs> and Matthew and Mark, Luke doesn't use it. Matthew and Mark, they use the word transfigured. Which is, what's going on here is a metamorphosis. And then that brings to, to mind the caterpillar who then cocoons and then becomes a butterfly or comes forth as a butterfly. We've probably all heard that analogy when it comes to that. So what's going on here as we look at this and as we begin to unravel this a little bit, this scene, and we're going to see it as his face is altered, the shining, we're going to look at all that, the light. We're going to see that what has always been on the outside is finally manifesting itself outwardly. Okay? So that's the word they use, metamorphosis, transfigured. That's why this is important, and we're going to see that because it's inside. This isn't like, um, I'm not going to touch this briefly, but it's not like, I can't remember the commercial that used to come on, but there used to be like, I think it was a car commercial, and it would come on, and then you'd have like a choir, and it'd be like, ah, and the light would come on from up high, and it would just, ah, and the guy like, yeah, I picked the right car, yeah, it's my car, ah, right? <laughs> and all these lights. It's not that. It's not an outward light coming down on Jesus like this. The, the light that's coming forth, his glory is coming from within. That's the idea we have here. I'm sorry, my voice isn't as good as we, we heard uh, our worship team earlier. It was, it, they were amazing. My voice, not so amazing. Sorry. So that's important because we're going to see a light that's unimaginable. We need to understand it's not a spotlight of heaven. It's not the spotlight of heaven coming down on him. The light that we are seeing, the source of the brilliance we're going to look at, is not outward, it's inward. That's very important to notice. And Matthew and Mark, they let us know that. As Luke said, he was altered, that the brilliance comes from within. That's very important. What he was inwardly has now begun to shine, and now we see it outwardly. So this is really cool, because what's inward is now coming outward through the veil of his flesh. Matthew 17, 2 says this, And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now his face shown as the sun let's stop there for a second try to imagine that try to picture that i don't know maybe even now we try to look at the sun still but as a kid you try you'd be like yeah i could look at the sun sure i, I dare you to look at the sun okay ah right and you're like oh imagine i try i started thinking of this when it says his face shone like the sun. And try looking at the sun. Even now, my eyes are more messed up than they were when I was a kid. And I still can't look at the sun. It's still like, ah. You know, you're like, oh, that was stupid. You know, I should have never done that. Imagine that. That's how bright that is. That's amazing. It shone like the sun. Now, all these things hold into your mind. We're going to have all these different thoughts. These pictures, I want you to hold them into your mind and try to imagine what we're looking at here. Put yourself in the place of these three guys. Shown like the sun. Then it says his robe is white and glistening. This translate a word, translates a word that has the idea of flashing like lightning. Now, the other day we had um, like a thunderstorm. And there was lightning everywhere. And you could see it whoosh, 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 everywhere, right? And I've seen like, you know, I haven't seen lightning like strike like right in front of me. I never have. Um, it'd probably be a pretty crazy thing. And it probably like, if you've watched movies, it'd probably blow you back like 30 feet. And your clothes would be torn off and you'd be like just crawling all seared and like smoky or whatever but <laughs> you know <laughs> but flashing like 
lightning. Now this is an interesting picture. His face is shining like the sun. His clothes became white. White as the light. The whitest light you could ever think of. His robe is white and glistening. And that, you know, when I, and when I see that word glistening, I think of someone's like, someone's great like smile with perfect white teeth and they're like, yeah. And it's all clean. You're like, whoa, man, you got nice teeth, brother. <laughs> but it's not that. But it's so white, you know, flashing like lightning. Mark 9.3 says, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. <laughs> okay, that's super white. Like, like I, I can't even picture that. And these guys are looking at it like, man, my clothes have never been that clean. You know, it's just super white, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Okay, they're astonished. We'll say that. And that must have stood out to Peter because that's Mark who took Peter's account for his gospel, right? So imagine Peter like, Ew, bro, like it's a white you've never seen. Like it, it's just so white. Imagine how many times Peter went over that and Mark's like, yeah, I get it. Okay, I get it already. It's white. No, you really don't get it because you weren't there. You had to be there to experience it, to know it was super white. <laughs> and Jesus' entire appearance was changed into a brilliant radiance of light. I think as you look at this, I think the greater miracle is him holding that back. Holding that back. I think that's the greater miracle because he could have let it go. Boom. And imagine, we'll just, okay, we'll just talk for a second here, guys. Imagine after this, they're walking. Chronologically speaking, they're, they're about six months out from the cross. So they've been with Christ three years, close to three years now. They know everything about him. They know all the gray hairs on his head, if he had any. They know if he walks like a sway or, you know, they know if his, his heels have cracks in them or whatever, you know, oh man, you know, they know his robe or whatever, you know, just, however, they know, every, you know, and imagine walking behind Christ and they're like, man, is he going to do it? The three of them, he's going to do it again. Or, you know, maybe poking Jesus on the side, do it again, man, do it again, just do it again one more time. Let everyone know. Show. Imagine just seeing it. And just, what an awesome thing. And I always think, man, to hold that back. To not let anyone know. No one see. Ah, that's a great miracle in and of itself. To be able to hold back his glory. I mean, I could go into a long thing because I think it's so amazing what Christ has done. To know who he is. To know who I am. And to know he did that and he went to the cross for little old me, all of us online, all of us here. We're not worth it. I don't know if you think you are online, but you're not. I'm not worth it. The great love of Christ always floors me. It always does. It always will. It's so powerful. It's so amazing. Don't ever forget it. When you really start to look at things, wow. I am floored every single time. Okay, so then in verse 30, and behold, this is really cool. Two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah. Now this is, <laughs> this is really cool because, uh, if you know anything about your Bible, these guys have been gone for a while. So now they just appear here, <laughs> which is really cool. But why these two guys? Why not Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, right? Why not King David, the line which the Messiah is to come from? Why not them? Why these two guys? Why Moses? Why Elijah? Well, let's throw out a couple things here for us to think about. It may be, it may be 
that these two represent those that are caught up to God. What am I saying? Okay, Moses would represent those who die and go to glory. Elijah represents, this is interesting, those who are caught up to heaven without death. It may be that. It may be. I'm saying maybe, okay? It may be that. That's interesting to me. As you start to look at why Moses and Elijah. Another one? It may also be that they represent the law and the prophets. Hmm. Moses, obviously, he would represent the law, the great lawgiver, right? Elijah, he would represent the prophets. In Israel, the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, Elijah. Remember, Elijah is supposed to come back for the great and terrible day of the Lord, uh, Malachi 4. Luke 24, 27 says this, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Remember, Jesus tells that to the two on the road to Emmaus. We're going to see that eventually. If the Lord should tarry, give it about another year, year and a half. We'll be there in Luke 24. It's going to take a while. But we'll see that. The guy's on the road to Emmaus. So here we have the great lawgiver and the great prophet. What's interesting, too, is if you flip ahead to Revelation, ooh, a very interesting book, a very fun book to read. Chapter 11, you have what is called the two witnesses. And you'll find that in chapter 11, verse 3 through 13, if you want to read on your own about the two witnesses. I find that interesting, these two guys. Now, personally, I believe that these are going to be the two witnesses that come back in Revelation 11. You know, you're allowed to have your own messed up opinion. I'll have mine. <laughs> Moses and Elijah. Now, it's interesting, too, when you read about Moses. You go over to the book of Jude, and you read 9, Jude 9, because it's only one chapter. It's like 20-something verses, verse 9. That Satan and Michael are kind of duking it out over the body of Moses. And that's where you'll see Michael didn't even want to bring an accusation against Satan. Hmm. I'm just going to throw it out there. That seems very interesting that they'd be duking it out over the body of Moses. Does God have something prepared for him later? Hmm. Something to think about. Very interesting to me. Now, you'll remember Elijah, he was caught up in the chariot of fire. He's walking along, and then boom, he's gone. <laughs> fire, caught up to heaven. And then when you read, as you start to read in Revelation, you'll see that these guys have certain powers, and the powers kind of mimic what you see in Moses and Elijah with the fire and the water and the plagues of Moses. You see that. So I tend to, I lean on the side that says, oh, the witnesses are going to be Eliza, Elijah. <laughs> Eliza. <laughs> That's some lady. I don't know who that is. <laughs> it's Elijah the prophet. <laughs> and Moses. Now, you know, you'll hear other things. I don't want to get into it. You might hear Enoch because he walked with God and was not and so on and so forth. But I tend to lean on Moses and Elijah. Two coming back, which is, that's really cool. That's really cool, and that's a whole other thing, so we won't get into it. But what are they talking about? It's interesting. They come, and they're talking about what? The decease. His decease, which he was about to accomplish, it says, at Jerusalem. You know, they could have talked about all kinds of other things. Uh, we don't know. The topic we're given here is that they're talking about his decease that he's about to accomplish they're talking about God's great plan. Now, that would have been a cool thing to hear, like how that conversation went. We're not told, so you can only, when you read these things, you know, and I have a pretty active imagination, so my mind starts to run wild. Like, what are they, they could have talked about anything, you know? They could have talked about, like, yeah, you know, I can't wait for the Dodgers to go back to back in 2021. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Jesus is like, yeah, I know. You know, Cody Bellinger's going to hit four grand slams. Like, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> He's going to turn it around. 
But anyways, they could have talked about all kinds of different things. And imagine what, you know, Moses is talking about and Elijah, you know. I remember a fire consumed the offering and hearts turned back to you. But it wasn't full. It wasn't complete. What you're going to do is going to be complete. Moses is like, I remember the exodus in the Red Sea. But it wasn't perfect and it wasn't complete. But what you're going to do, Jesus, it's going to be complete. Imagine what they're talking about. I just, you know, I love to think like that. Like, what are these guys talking about? You know, it's real interesting to me. But they're talking about his decease, which he's going to accomplish. Decease, interesting enough, in the Greek is exodus. Exodus. Hmm. It means departure by death. Literally, it signifies a way out. Huh. That's interesting. It calls to mind when you read this, the exodus from Egypt, God's great act of deliverance in the Old Testament. And now we're going to get a greater act, salvation. He's going to make a way when there was no way. Hmm, interesting. His decease, through his suffering, death, and resurrection, Jesus will lead God's people to salvation through a new and a greater exodus. Ooh. I mean, that gives me chills right now talking about it. That's amazing. Amen. Now, that word accomplish. Okay. There's a Greek word. Play rao. It means to fulfill, to complete, to carry out to the full. Notice it says accomplished, which means he was not a victim. In no way anywhere in here is Christ a victim. He accomplished. He was handed over, yes. He was rejected, yes. He was crucified, yes. Nowhere in that is he a victim. He was accomplishing, notice, what he came to do. This is what he came to do. John 19.30, we're familiar with this. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It was accomplished on the cross. He came. And nowhere in here is he a victim. Yes, he suffered. Yes, he died. He was crucified. We know all the gory details. He was not a victim came to accomplish what the Father had sent him to do. Very, very amazing when you look at this. And then now we're going to see some interesting things, some human elements from Peter and these guys. <laughs> I love these guys because they're so easy to relate to. <laughs> they could be any one of us. It says in verse 32, but Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. <laughs> And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And then 33, it says, then it happened as they were parting from him. Here we go. Peter speaks again. Peter says to Jesus, Master, it's good we're here, you know. <laughs> Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then notice at the end, it says, not knowing what he said. Jeez, I really love Peter. <laughs> Man, he fills me with so much joy and hope. And, and I'm just like, oh, man, praise the Lord. But notice, it says they were sleeping and then they wake up. So imagine this. Because it says as Jesus prayed, now his face is altered. We have all the descriptions. His robe is white. It's glistening. Flashes like lightning. His face shone like the sun. Peter said it's the whitest white that you could ever see. Not even the greatest launderer on earth could make it that white. <laughs> That's how white it is. So imagine this. And I don't know about you guys, but when I'm asleep, <laughs> man, I don't like the light at all. Like up in my room, I have drapes like drawn. I have, we have two sets of drapes, right? We have one set and then over it, we have the um, 
darkening, room darkening ones because man, when I'm asleep, I want it to be dark. I don't want light anywhere. Like, and then, you know, somehow, sometimes, like, it's moved and that one ray of light's, like, hitting you right in your eye and you're like, oh, this is messed up, God. What are you trying to do to me? I just want to sleep. Now, imagine these guys are asleep and this light that we can't even imagine is just like, Whoa, and you're like, oh, you can't even see it, like, ah, oh, right? Like, I can, I can only imagine, like, what's going on. You know, they're asleep like the Three Stooges in one bunk or something. And, you know, have you ever seen that? It, <laughs> it makes me laugh so much. The Three Stooges are great. But, <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. And you have all this going on. They're asleep. Now they're woken up. This bright light. And it says they saw his glory. And then notice it says they saw his glory and the two men. So that's interesting too because my wife's dad, when he was younger, he was the favorite child. So, it's funny because I think of this because it says they saw his glory and the two men. So, he would always get introduced as, this is my son Johnny. And he had two sisters. Right? And so they would introduce him as, this is my son Johnny. And these are his siblings, his sisters. <laughs> they never had a name. Like it was, he was the only one who had a name and then his sisters were just there, you know <laughs> So that ran through my mind as I see this they saw Jesus in his glory and the two guys <laughs> But as you look at this That's where our eyes should be on Jesus Christ Not on everything else on him because it's easy and we do that a lot we take our eyes off of Christ and we focus on all the cool stuff going on around and we don't notice him any longer. I thought that was interesting. They saw him and his glory and then they saw the two men. And then it says Peter speaks. <laughs> this is so, so great. So it says they awake, right? And that the guys, Moses and Elijah, they begin to depart. And then Peter's like, oh, oh man, I got to say something. Like, I bet, what's going on? This is so awesome. It's almost like he's like, oh, this is so good. Hey, guys, what do we do? What do we do? They're leaving. Hey, guys, don't leave. Stop. Hey, hey, you know, oh, no, no. You guys, where are you going? Party just started. <laughs> you got to stay. You got to stay. Oh, you know, you know. And then he just starts to, to say something, right? <laughs> Let's build three tabernacles, right? One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. He doesn't want them to leave. He just wakes up and now it says they're, they're departing. Now how that looks, I don't know. Departing, they could be like, just like vanishing. <laughs> like, like, were they even really there? Or maybe are they going up? Like, oh, into heaven, right? You, you don't know how they're going. They could have just like vanished, like gone, or like slowly fade. We don't know, but they're departing. And either way, it, it prompts Peter to say something, to open his mouth. And I think we can kind of relate to this in a way, at least I can. I, I, I've been sitting in service sometimes, and whoever's teaching, whoever's preaching says something. And it's like God is like, it's just like, almost it's like you and him. And that's it. And he's speaking right at you. I can remember lots of times like that. And I remember when it ends, you don't want it to end. You're like, oh, I just want to sit here for a minute longer. When the presence of God is so heavy that you don't want to move. That you don't want to leave. Or you've been to a retreat and God spoke to you. And you're like, oh, you're like on cloud nine. And you're like, man, I don't want this to ever end. Who cares about my wife? Leave them alone. I just want to sit up here on the mountaintop. 
<laughs> Praise the Lord. My wife's laughing, so don't worry. <laughs> but, you know, you, you go and it feels like, oh, I don't ever want to leave. I don't want this to end. God met me in a special way this weekend. I can relate to what Peter's kind of like, oh, no, no, I don't want it to end. This is, this is too good to be true. There is a time when God says enough. It's got to end. And you go back. You can't stay on the mountaintop forever. It's got to end. But I can relate to Peter here because I've been in that situation where the, the presence of God is so heavy and you don't want it to end. And you want it to just like, oh, I just... Let me sit here a little while longer with you, Lord. The show must go on, right, is the great saying. The show must go on. But you don't want it to, and I can, I can relate to Peter as he does this. Mark, I like what Mark says. When you read his account, Mark actually tells us Peter spoke because he didn't even know what to say. <laughs> so he just spoke. <laughs> not knowing what to say. He didn't know, you know, well, I'm just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like, almost like when you watch, like, cartoons and they have the dog talk and the dog's, like, listening and the people are like, blah, 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 sit. Blah, 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 stay. You know? <laughs> I wonder if that was what's going on with Peter sometimes. He doesn't really understand. And it's funny that Mark says, not knowing what to say, he just said something. Now that's, this brings us to some decent advice. If one day you're going along and suddenly Jesus, Moses, and Elijah appear and you have no idea what to say, say nothing. <laughs> Just be quiet. <laughs> Don't say anything. And if you do that, the Lord will look at you and he'll say, they were at the Friday night Bible study. Oh, they learned the lesson. <laughs> so, what does he say? In the end, he says, Master, let's make three tabernacles. Here we see Peter makes a mistake, right? He shouldn't have said anything. Mark tells us not knowing what he should say. He just said it. The mistake here that you'll see is that now Christ is on the same level as Moses and Elijah. He's put them on equal ground. And if you read your Bible through, you'll see numerous places that people try to worship something else. Ah, ah, angels, they'll say, get up. Don't worship me. It's a very dangerous thing to do. And Peter makes the mistake here of putting all three on the same level. Let's make one for you, Jesus. Let's make one for you, Elijah. Let's make one for you, Moses which puts them all equal. We all know that God does not share his glory. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. God's in the business of getting all the glory. He is the sole proprietor in that business. <laughs> He's the only one who's got a shop that says glory. You do not take it from him, trust me. And if you are in any level of leadership or in any way feeling called by God to do a work in which we are all called by God to do something to further his kingdom, let me tell you now, don't ever rob him of his glory. <laughs> don't make that mistake. He will put you on a shelf quicker than you can imagine. All the glory is his. We have nothing to glory in. The Bible says our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We don't have any. There's nothing to glory in. We did not do anything. Me teaching here does not mean my blood was shed on the cross for all of you. It's not my blood. It's not any of our blood. It's his. He gets all the glory. He deserves all the honor, all the praise. None goes to us. We are just the vessel in his hand. We are the clay. He is the potter. Don't ever forget it. 34 and 36 says, While he was saying this, a cloud came. So, it's starting to build. It's getting, it's getting even like, ooh, just all these pictures in your mind, right? A cloud came and overshadowed them. 
and they were fear, fearful as they entered the cloud. Now, this isn't like a, a gloomy, like dark cloud. This is actually white, lightning, like bright. This is, you know, when you, you picture clouds in your mind, you kind of think of like, oh, stormy clouds and like, oh, it's all dark and all the lightning. <laughs> And all the rain, right, right? All the rain's like just, <laughs> you're like, oh, this cloud, you know? This is actually a white cloud, and it, it's bright, flashes, all, all that. It's a different kind of cloud, so don't get that picture in your mind. Picture like white light coming. And it says, they were fearful as they entered the cloud. Verse 35, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is, <laughs> I would have been like, what? Like, I don't know about you guys, but I've never seen a cloud move that's white, that comes at me, and then I enter it, and it starts to talk to me. I'm like, what the heck is this, man? This is crazy. You see this, James? How about you, Johnny? You know, you, Johnny, you're young, you know. You have a better imagination than I do. Have you ever seen this? No, no, no. They're scared, right? And then the voice says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. So we see seen a cloud come, right? It says the cloud came and it overshadowed them. In the Old Testament, you guys are familiar with this. This is called the Shekinah glory. Shekinah. It symbolized the immediate presence and power of God. And remember, if you were with us or if you've seen the studies, early on we saw this. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, when the cloud came and overshadowed Mary. And then she was with child, who we know to be Jesus. We've seen that already. This is what's going on again. And then it says they were fearful. So it went from them saying, it's good, we're here, to all oh, shaking, you know, falling down, scared. Right? They went from, it's good, we are here. To now, they were fearful. So I think, you know, just if you just think about it, I'd be pretty freaked out too. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that before. And a, a cloud like that came and I'm like, oh, you know, and I'm in the middle of it. Like, what's going on? And then it starts to talk to me. Yeah, I'm going to be a little freaked out. <laughs> Remember, coming into the presence of God, it has that way of doing that. We see these different examples as you read your Bible in the Old Testament, you see Isaiah when he has the vision of the Lord and the train of his robe filling the temple. And woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, right? And that's where you get the seraphim coming with the tongs and he goes into the altar, grabs the, the coal, puts it on his lips, right? So you see that. See Daniel, he says, all my comeliness has turned to ashes in the presence of the Lord. John, if you remember, on Patmos, fell down like a dead man so this isn't like a new thing that's happening we see this through the bible and the presence of the lord moves and he comes it's like uh, everyone's like oh you know you don't know what to do and then it speaks the cloud speaks like I said, imagine it I'm always trying to make you guys picture I like for you guys to see what's going on in your mind imagine that the cloud Actually speaking, this is my beloved son. Hear him. You'd be like, where'd that come from, right? You can imagine this play out in your mind. And in the Greek, this actually means to be hearing him continually. That's really interesting to me. Why? Because that's the same instru instruction for us today. We need to be continually hearing him. And what is he saying should be the question we should be asking a lot. What's Christ saying? What's God saying? What's his word saying? Whatever situation we're in, what does the word of God say? What are you saying? Remember Jesus said, let him hear who has ears to hear. Him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Hear. What's he saying? Don't listen to anything else because the world is screaming at you 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. All kinds of craziness. The world is screaming, telling you to do this, it's good to do this, or you should do this, it's best for you to do this, or you should do this, and oh, this is happening because you didn't do this, and this and that, and this and that, and you know, your kids are like this because of this, you need to do this, you shouldn't have done this. All these things are flying at you. Whether it's TV, radio, social media, movies, billboards. They even have billboards that are like TVs now. Like, I don't even know how that's safe. Like, they want you to stay focused on the, on the road, right? Don't look at your phone, but look at this TV on the side of the road. Watch the commercial while you're driving 75 miles an hour down the freeway. Yeah, I think I want that. Like, what? Like, I don't know how that's good, but hey, it's there. But the world is screaming at you. And so often, because it's everywhere, at our heels, we listen to that. And we start looking, and we start filling our mind with all that stuff. And before you know it, the voice of the Lord has been drowned out and you can't even recognize his voice any longer because you've, you've tuned yourself in to hear everything else and you've tuned out the Lord. Very dangerous. Be continually hearing him. Be continually hearing him. How do we do that? Stay in your word. Read. Pray. You want to know the Lord's voice? Read his word. And when all that stuff around you and all the stuff on TV and in the movies starts bombarding you, you can hear the voice of the Lord because you've tuned. You've tuned him in and you recognize it when he speaks. And you'll recognize it. And ah, that's wrong. And the word of God says no. Disagrees with that. Very important to stay in your, I can't stress it enough. Stay in the word of God. It's the most relevant book of every single generation. Pick it up, stay in the word of God. You want to know how to hear his voice? Read his word. Speak to him. He will speak to you, I guarantee it. And then it says they told no one. Mark says that Jesus actually commanded them not to say anything. Matthew says, he adds a little more, he says not until he is risen from the dead. Now, this whole event that we just read, the transfiguration, this is interesting. Obviously, this was interesting to them. So much so, Peter references, I wanted, I wanted you to, to hear this what Peter had to say in his second letter chapter 1 16 through 18 he said for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses so here we go he's referencing this we were eyewitnesses to his majesty for he received from God the Father honor and glory and then here we go when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This, you know, he probably was itching to talk about this ever since it happened. And he writes it here. Imagine Peter is like the only one who can walk around and say, ha ha, I'm the only one God ever came out, spoke and told, shut up. <laughs> I'm the only one guys <laughs> I mean you know <laughs> it's kind of cool when you look at it but you know he writes it here when the voice came it came from heaven and he writes it down for all of them so we see Peter clearly remembers this because he's writing this before he what tradition tells us was crucified upside down John mentioned this in his gospel and his gospel is written late the latest gospel his five writings are the 
what most scholars believe to be the last writings of the New Testament. He's old. This is around, this is getting close to the turn of the, the first century. So he's old. And if you guys remember in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we what? We beheld his glory. This stuck with John. Whew. This would have stuck with me. This was an awesome thing. And like I said earlier, to me the greater miracle is that Christ held it back. He could have at any at any point. And I bet the three guys were like, come on, show it. Show it just a little bit. Just a little. Just a, just a little. Jesus, please, just a little. It'd be so awesome. Let's just get a little taste of it again. But he held it back. And when you read Philippians, it brings to mind right now. When you read Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And it says he put on the likeness of a man, came as a servant, humbled himself and died on the cross. When you read Philippians chapter 2 there, as I'm thinking about it now. How amazing is that? He humbled himself. He took the form of a man, one of us. The one who created everything. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's how much, if you ever doubt, God doesn't love me and you doubt it. Look at what Christ has done. Name another king that would do that. I can't think of one. That is truly amazing. Let that resonate. Let that sit in your mind for a while. And let that take root in your heart. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. That is so amazing. And I tell people all the time, meditate on the love of Christ. The love God has for you, it will blow your mind. Think about it. Oh, man. It's so amazing to know I'm so worthless. That sounds weird, right? <laughs> but to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I'm worth it all. Sit on that. So as we saw tonight, let's stay focused on Christ as everything moves around us, as the world tries to tell us every which way but right. Let's tune our ears. Let's incline our ears to hear the voice of the Lord. In these last days, it's so important. Everything's out there to get us. And I'm not trying to freak you out like, you know that song, Somebody's Watching You? <laughs> I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> I always feel like... That one, that one. Okay, sorry. But I don't want you to feel like that, but the world, the enemy, he doesn't want to make it easy for us. But we make it easy for him when we decide not to get into the Word of God. When we decide ourselves not to pray I encourage all of us tonight when we leave here let's make a concerted effort let's make a real effort let's determine in our hearts to incline our ears to hear the voice of the Lord it's so important tune our ears to hear the voice of Christ let's pray father we thank you so much for tonight for your word so awesome as we read through it Lord we see how much you love us everything you've done for us father we are so thankful so grateful there are words that are not part of my vocabulary I can't even describe how great it is father thank you 
Help us, Father, as we were just reading, to have a laser-like focus on you in these last days. Let our lives bring you glory. May we live in such a way that the world around us sees you. Father, we desire more of you. That's why we're here tonight. We want to draw closer to you. We want to know more about you. We just want to sit at your feet and soak up like a sponge as much as we can, Father. Even to the point where we're overfilling and overflowing. Father, fill us. Use us in these last days. We want to be ones who hear you. Help us to incline our ears to hear your voice, Father. And in these last days, may our lives draw many to you and bring you glory. Use us, Father. Here we are. Send us. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the honor and all the glory which you so rightly deserve. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. God bless. If you have any prayer requests, like I always say, put it out there. We'll come together as one in the group. Lift your petition to the throne of grace. I love you guys. God bless. I'll see you next week.